we're going to have uh, Jessica Croker actually speak uh, about the adolescent brain. Dr. Grease was um, scheduled to come, but she was unable to join us today. So Jessica has agreed to pinch hit for us um, on the adolescent brain. So the teenage years can be very trying. Um, teens test limits. Adolescence is a time of terrific growth, insight, brilliance, creativity, and stupidity. What are some key things to remember when gatekeepers work with youth using a developmentally appropriate, trauma-informed, racially equitable framework? To help us explore the teen brain is Jessica Croker. I'll do a quick bio of Jessica's. Jessica is a training specialist and mental health therapist with, at Project Harmony. Her work is focused on trauma in both therapeutic interventions with victims of abuse and training throughout the community on recognizing trauma and its symptoms. She is currently coordinating Omaha's Trauma-Informed Community Initiative. Additionally, Jessica provides therapy in rural Nebraska and previously worked several years in foster child adoption and permanency services. Jessica earned her master's in public administration and master's in social work from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Please welcome Jessica. Thank you. This is my first in-person training since March and it feels monumental. Uh, yeah, it feels monumental. I heard somebody up at the top while I was walking down here saying, yep, I'm just living my best COVID life. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I feel like I've been doing for six months. Just, uh, yeah, living my best life. <laughs> so um, I am here today. I was going to be with you later this afternoon, but now you're going to get me twice. So you're welcome. Um, you're living your best COVID life, I suppose, now too. Um, so today I am going to introduce you to normative adolescent development. So in order for us to understand how to respond to a teenager or an adolescent effectively, we need to understand what's underneath the surface. What do they have going on? Why are they acting in the way that they are? Um, and when we have that basic understanding, when we have that foundation, then it changes the way that we respond to them and, and our interventions can be much more effective. So the outline of this is as follows. Um, you can read it, I don't need to. Um, and, and the whole basis of this is that all behavior is communication. So every action that anybody, adolescent or not, every behavior that they exhibit is trying to communicate something. Now, what we're challenging you is to um, understand better what an adolescent's behavior is um, communicating so that you can answer that communication effectively and get their needs met effectively and understanding that your reaction is everything. That as an adolescent gives you heck and you respond, you can either go um, nuclear, as this image depicts, or uh, I know that there's a joke in here. Uh, this is Steven Seagal. You can put on your both best Steven Seagal, right? And uh, have the same response to everything, slow and calm and steady. Um, I don't know. His reaction is the same. Does that mean he's a good actor or a bad actor? I'm not really for sure, but um, we encourage you to kind of channel that where you really pay attention to your reaction and know that um, your reaction has a lot of weight, especially in responding to teenagers or adolescents. So we, we start this with understanding what is developmental competence. Now, in normal circumstances, I would have you get in small groups and talk about this, but um, today I won't make you do that. But as just think in your mind, as I say developmental competence, what does that mean to you? What do you think of just by, by those two words? Imagine what your definition would be. And now I'll explain what we mean by developmental competence. Developmental competence is really understanding where a child or adolescent's perceptions or behaviors, where they are biologically, physically, psychologically, what developmental stage that they're in. That understanding of where a child is in their development or where a, a human is in their development or their lifespan is developmental competence. It's, un, it's important for us to have developmental competence. It's important for us to understand 
how humans develop and where in that developmental span they are because we're going to react differently based off of where they are in their development. I was thinking as I was, was preparing for this five minutes before <laughs> the presentation, just kidding, uh, more like 15, no. Um, I was thinking the way that we respond to a three-month-old is very different than how we respond to a three-year-old. And that's only, that's less than three years of an age gap, right? But the, the types of words and sounds that you make for a three-month-old versus a three-year-old is very different. And then you consider a three-month-old or a three-year-old compared to a 13-year-old, and the way that you interact with them, just based off of their age and what you know about development, is very different. And then you think the way you respond to a 13-year-old versus a 33-year-old is very different just based off of the way that they are in their development. Based off of a 99-year-old, the way you're gonna to respond to a 33-year-old versus a 99-year-old is very different because of where they are. So you already have some foundation in developmental competence. Understanding that um, is developmental competence. So we're gonna dig in more into adolescence and help you understand that adolescence development so that you can respond to them in a, in a way that's appropriate to where they are in their development. So every once in a while throughout this training, you'll see a slide that looks like this. This is just an indication that you have this information or this worksheet in your packet of information. So let's apply developmental competence. Here we have a kid who looks like a kid. Um, you know, he's probably about 13 years old. And then we have somebody who's a little bit older. Um, I would say he's like 19, 20, probably somewhere around there, early 20s. Um, and then we have an adult. And the point of this is to say that this 13-year-old is not the same as this, adult, this early 20-year-old gentleman and who is not the same as this adult. Kids are not just tiny versions of adults. They're actually biologically different. The way that their brain functions, the way that their brain is developing, where they are in their development is different. Um, and so even though, for instance, this gentleman in the middle in the green shirt may look like an adult, as he is in his late teens, early 20s, he's still not just an adult. Um, they are not all the same. Even if you might look more like an adult, until you are in probably your late 20s, you are not the same um, in terms of where your brain is functioning as an adult. And so adolescence is really a new um, phenomenon. We didn't really understand adolescence until really recent years or recent decades. Um, because their lifespan was different, there was a lot of factors in play, but now we understand that adolescence is a chunk of time, mostly through the teenage years, and what we often associate it with is, is puberty. But puberty is really the physical changes that come from um, development and, and developing into an adult, but adolescence goes beyond just the physical changes and puts into to play the, the, the changes that are happening in the brain as well. So it's a combination of the physical and the psychological, all of the things that are happening during that time span in a child's life that, that equals up to adolescence. So, oh, and social. So the psychological and social transition. So we look at this and we see, this is, this is kind of outdated, uh, and I, but we look at this, yeah, there's, there's a thing to say, replace pictures, that did not get done. Um, but it still stands the same. We see these people on here and my question to you is, what age do you think these, these individuals are? Do I have any guesses? 17 or 18? Any other guesses? It's LeBron James that gave it away, wasn't it? They're 16 years old in this picture. But how many of you, if you didn't know, would have guessed that these were 16-year-olds? They don't physically look like 16-year-olds. They look like fully developed adults. And, and we can make assumptions off of what they should be able to do or shouldn't be doing based off of their appearance, but all of these 
people in these pictures are adolescents. And so we need to understand, sometimes because somebody has gone through puberty and looks like an adult, doesn't mean that they're not an adolescent still, that their brain hasn't fully developed. And so what happens during um, the developmental phases of life is in early, in early childhood, um, the cerebellum is really developing. It's the physical coordination. So, you know, kids are learning how to walk and balance and jump and skip and do all of those things in early childhood. Your brain really develops from the bottom up. And so that's really what's happening in early childhood is this down bottom part of the brain is developing. And then we get into a little bit older, um, maybe into elementary school, and things like motivation are developing, and positive reinforcement is the first thing to develop. And motivation is in terms of relationships and how you um, interact and find your space or your belonging in the world. And you see your experience through the eyes of your, your parents or your caregivers. And then we get into the adolescent phase, which we'll talk a lot about here. But that's the amygdala, so it's kind of the center area of the brain. The amygdala is what's really developing, and that's the emotional part of the brain. This is the fight, fight, or freeze part of the brain. So this is the part of the brain that's really um, emphasized in the adolescent years, which also happens to be the part of the brain that's really dramatic and really invested in emotions and, and fight, flight, or freeze and adrenaline and all of that. And so there's just a lot happening in adolescence. And then it's not getting until um, the mid-20s that the, the prefrontal cortex, or what I call the upstairs part of the brain, is really starting to develop. And as I was working with Sarah, Dr. Sarah Grace on this presentation, she was telling me that, that she's reading some new research that is suggesti suggesting that this judgment part of the brain is really not developing until much closer to the age of 30. And she said what she was researching was how technology has really started to have an impact on how that part of the brain develops and is actually delaying some of that. So, so we'll see how, how some of this research informs our developmental competence here in the next several years as we're learning more about how um, our ever-changing technological world is impacting our development. And so it needs to be very clearly understood that judgment is the last piece of the brain, the last brain structure to be developing. And that doesn't happen until into our, well into our 20s. So when we're expecting teenagers to be able to think very clearly and, and, and formulate judgments that are safe and healthy and, and in their best interest, that doesn't happen. That's not realistic. That's not where their brain is. So we find balance in all of this at age 20. We'll skip some of these. Um, and so I, this might be a handout as well. You might have this as a handout. So as we talk about um, the teen brain moving forward, so that was developmental competence. We are going to break down how the teen brain differs or the adolescent brain differ differs and how they perceive, how they process, and how they respond. So very crucial to how you're going to react because it's important for you to understand how the teen is perceiving, processing, and responding to information. So we understand what perception is. Um, and I found this incredibly interesting. I won't even introduce it. I'll just let it play. Dr. Deborah Jurgelin Todd and her associate Stacy Gruber are scanning the brains of teenagers to see how they read emotion. The small but intriguing study at McLean Hospital near Boston is mapping differences between the brains of adults and teens. I came to uh, this research with the assumption that the teenager was going to look a lot like an adult. In fact, I assumed that the 13-year-old brain would respond quite similarly to the adult brain in terms of the kinds of tasks that we were asking them to do when they were in the magnet. To explore this, Todd put teenage and adult volunteers through an MRI and monitored how their brains responded to a series of pictures. Here we go. Ready, ready. The volunteers were asked to discern the emotion on these faces. The results were surprising. One of 
the interesting things about the findings are that they suggest that the teenagers are not able to correctly read all the feelings in the adult face. All the adults identified this emotion as fear, but the teenagers invariably saw something different. Patrick, how you doing? Craig. Tell me about those faces. What were those faces feeling? A lot of them were shocked or angry, and um, I think that was it. OK, shocked and angry. Yeah. OK, thank you. They see uh, anger when there isn't anger or sadness when there isn't sadness. And if that's the case, then clearly their own behavior is not going to match that of the adult. So you'll see a miscommunication, both in terms of what they think the adult is feeling, but also and then what the response should be to that. The reason for this, she believes, is that teenagers use a different part of the brain to assess the emotion on people's faces. This is a really uh, nice picture highlighting the fact that in an adolescent brain, the relative activation of the prefrontal region or this anterior front part of the brain is less than it is in the adults. But in contrast to that, the more emotional region or that gut response region has more activation compared to the adult. So that the relationship between these two regions is very different. And we think that that's been a very important finding in terms of understanding adolescent behavior. So what does that tell us? That tells us that Teens, when they see your faces or your reactions, when they see the reactions of other adults and they have really big reactions to that, we need to understand that what they're perceiving is different than what we as adults are perceiving. That they are much more likely to perceive anger or shock or things that um, more negative emotions because of where they are in their development. Remember I said they're, face, they're really developing in the amygdala and that's the part of the brain that everything seems exaggerated. So because of where they are in their development, I can't emphasize this enough, they're going to perceive things differently and they're much more likely to associate negative emotions when they are interpreting the reactions of the people around them. And that is because the amygdala is, um, is developing. So as we look at this picture right here, I want you to take a moment and see what you think, what you see. Raise your hand when you see what this image is. If you've seen this before, please don't ruin it for other people. Raise your hand when you know what you're looking at. Okay, got one person. It's not, it's, it's, I'm looking at it just fine. I see it. Lisa, do you see it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've got one, another person. Maybe look a little harder. By now, if you can't see it, it's pretty clear. I don't know what's taking so long. All right, maybe like turn your head or something. I don't know, like. Raise your hand if you see the cat. Okay, that's wrong, but okay. <laughs> How many of you see a cow? One. It's a cow. So look a little harder, maybe squint your eyes. Tell me when you see the cow. Yes, you refuse to see the cow. Well, maybe we should get some interventions. Maybe is uh, any law enforcement currently here? Maybe a law enforcement presence could pressure you into seeing the cow. Now, can you see the cow? Now that we give you an outline. Oh. Can you see it now? Yeah. The cow was in the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it didn't matter, right? One, you're looking at it and you're seeing a cat. We have these different perceptions. Everybody is looking at it. And, and I can heckle you as much and give you as much time as you need. And um, I don't know, I could degrade you or yell at you. But you aren't going to be able to see this cow if you're holding on to that same perspective, right? It wasn't until um, we maybe gave you an outline 
or provided a little bit more structure to the, the cow being there to help you see that there was actually a cow there. Is there anything you would like to add to that analogy? Okay. So we need to remember that, that often what we expect from teenagers, they're not seeing it the same way. So we can, you know, do a lot of different interventions, but if they're not perceiving it the same way, until we address that and help them understand what, what we're expecting of them or what we're showing them, it's not going to um, go too well. And so to help us address this perception, we need to be really good at explaining things, um, slowing things down and explaining what our expectations are. And the thing that's tricky about this is we have to do it all the time. Often we can't just do it once, like the beginning of our services with the youth. We can't just do it once and expect them to remember it or to follow it all the time. We constantly be, need to be slowing down and explaining what things are, not in a condescending way, um, but in a, in a gentle and firm way. And then check for their understanding. Have them repeat back what they understood that you said. Um, and anticipate that misunderstanding. I think a lot of times we interpret that misunderstanding as intentionally um, refusing or intentionally trying to misbehave, but there's a lot of reasons why, because of where their brain development is, that they are likely to misunderstand. And so we're gonna move on to processing. Um, so we already understand that they perceive things different, and now we need to see how the brain is actually processing information differently than it, in adults. And that is, again, because the amygdala is really the part of the brain that is being, um, being developed at this time. Here's another video. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So the way the brain works in early childhood, all of these synapses and everything is happening and there's so many of them. Um, that is why children are so great at picking things up like language or um, riding bikes or trying all of these new things and they can pick it up and um, it's so important that we give them so many different types of opportunities so that they can experience the world and their brains are just sponges, right? And they're taking all of that information and there's so much brain activity with all those neurons and synapses and all of that. And then as we get into adolescence, something really phenomenal is happening where 
some of the brain synapses and, and if you think of it as like the brain as a tree and all of these branches on a tree are just blooming and developing through childhood and then the branches that aren't being used so much, that aren't so necessary for the rest of development start to get trimmed out. So the pruning, pruning of these neurons is happening so that these other branches that are being used can be a lot more efficient and effective so much quicker. They become like 30,000 or 3,000 times faster during this pruning process because we're not trying to support all of these neurons, but we're trying to support rather these neurons that we're going to be using, that we have been using more often. And so um, when we look at the way that the brain works, I love this di diagram. We have an adult who's been through the pruning, who's got fully developed prefrontal cortexes. This is how their brain is often functioning, um, where, where they're out of this prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex does things like executive functioning, critical thinking, problem solving, um, long-term consequences, all of those things happen in the, the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe. And so in an adult brain, that's gone through all of this pruning and ha has fully developed um, is going to be run by this prefrontal cortex. And even when somebody pushes their button or they're in a fight, flight, freeze moment, they're more likely to be able to rely upon that prefrontal cortex or that frontal lobe, right? That, that sometimes the amygdala might really get activated, but the frontal lobe is really driving the show here. Where in the adolescent brain, again, that amygdala is really developing and we have all of this pruning happening that's trying to help all of this work more efficiently, the amygdala runs the show. So again, when we think of amygdala, we think of exaggerated. Everything looks and feels exaggerated when that amygdala is, is, is driving. And even when the frontal lobe is activated, even when that prefrontal cortex is activated, it's still the amygdala that runs the show. So even when adolescents are doing critical thinking, problem solving things, we can, we can imagine that there's probably a lot of emotion or um, exaggeration behind it, right? Because that's where they are in their development. We'll skip that video. So we need to remember that because of this, because of where they're going in um, this development, they have a bias towards the present. They have a six inch horizon, as we, as we like to call it, where they're in that amygdala. The prefrontal cortex does the long-term problem solving um, and critical thinking. They think far out. This, the amygdala is based on the here and now. They're not worried about what's gonna happen after the here and now. There's a very big bias in this, um, in this moment and what's gonna gratify me in this moment regardless of the consequences of that gratification later on. And time feels different. Time is such a, I mean, if, if, if uh, a worldwide pandemic has taught me anything, it's that, that time is a really wonky thing anyway, right? Like what is time? Time feels very different to an adolescent who is really driven by the amygdala and is focused on the here and now. Be beyond that, where they are, they've got you know maybe 16 years of life versus you know our 29 years of life, and so things feel different. Time is very different. They're not worried about the future as much. So so their concepts of time, how they perceive time, is going to be different. And then we have the role of reward. Um, that where they are in development, which is, you know, I think throughout all of life, that you are much more likely to respond to positive reinforcement than you are to negative reinforcements. And that's grained in our biology. Our biology has taught us, teaches us, or where we develop, we develop first to respond to, to positive reinforcements and then later on develop um, the whole respond to negative reinforcements. So again, it's that, that saying, you attract more flies with honey than vinegar. And that's really what works best with, with youth and adolescents, that, that we need to, to really focus and emphasize positive reinforcements. The more that we focus on providing positive reinforcements, the less we have to rely on negative reinforcements. 
Um, the, the prefrontal cortex is really the CEO of the brain, and this is, this is reinforcing what we've talked about, where the, the, the CEO part of the brain is the last to, to mature. It's what matures closer to 30, and it's the part that allows them to think critically. And so a lot of times, youth aren't able to rely on that prefrontal cortex. And so as adults, who hopefully have fully developed prefrontal cortex, our role is to be that prefrontal cortex for the youth, be that surrogate prefrontal cortex. Um, so help them think about the future, help them critically think, help them with, with um, working through what are alternatives or processing what the, the consequences are. Help them assess, plan, implement, evaluate. evaluate. Um, because their brains aren't um, at a place where they can do that to full capacity yet. So now we'll go into the um, third, which is how youth re react. So um, this is based off of um, they're, they're less likely to consider long-term effects, which is going to change the way that they react. They react much more to a survival-oriented mentality. That fight, flight, freeze mentality is very natural for them. So when youth um, are in their amygdala, um, that's what we would consider, um, well, excuse me, when they're in their prefrontal cortex, that's what we would consider a cold cognition, where things are calm, where there's less emotionality, um, maybe they're not perceiving angry or negative emotions, um, they're able to make more mature, rational decisions. When Lisa was talking about the W, I imagine these cold cognitions are when you're you know, at the top of the W and you just had a really profound conversation with your adolescence, and you're like, wow, he's just growing into a really great young man. And um, you're able to, you know, you, they, they seem like an adolescent, right? And then you get into a hot cognition. And that's when it's high arousal and intense emotion, and there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, that's when we're really getting into that amygdala-driven response. And when there's high emotionality, there's low rationality. So we really need to know this, that um, if somebody has what I call flipped their lid and is really functioning in their amygdala, when we have adolescents, who are at the bottom of their W, when we have adolescents who somebody has pushed their emotional button and you're seeing them act really irrational, um, they're not thinking critically, when they're in that high emotionality state, they are not able to rationalize. We cannot expect them to be thinking um, clearly, problem solving, thinking about long-term consequences. That's, that's something that adults struggle with. When our emotions are high, our rationality goes low. Um, but that's even more emphasized in adolescence because of the part of the brain that is developing. So when we're rational, we're able to think before acting, learn from our mistakes, anticipate problems, use, uh, use our own willpower. But the adolescence response um, is very in impulsive, self-defeating, no willpower, follows peer group. Um, this is where they are in their development. We have to understand this, that, that, that this is normal and, and healthy development. It's a pain, but it is normal and healthy. I just uh, want to ask a question here. Um, whenever we do these trainings in person with people sitting near each other, um, we often ask, what is your strategy for getting the kid out of their amygdala or high emotionality state of mind and connecting them to their inner um, Yoda? Anyone have any ways to try and get them out of that amygdala high emotion state that they'd share? These are usually really helpful to hear from the field. So um, one of our colleagues said you, um, the best practice for her is to continue listening as the person is expressing this, even if it doesn't make sense, and ask questions like motivational interviewing. And um, I recommend this when we do our trainings to law enforcement, that if for nothing else, as they're expressing and expressing, they're also losing a lot of energy and getting to a point um, just in terms of steam uh, when they can get down to um, a little bit more calmer place. Anyone else um, have a practice? Yes, ma'am.
And what we see, uh, I think a lot of adults do, is first assume the behavior is intentional, and we're trying to push back on that assumption, and then the other is say, it's not part of my job. Well, a kid cannot uh, just bring the learning part of their brain to school. They are a whole being. I doubt any of us are here just as the learning part of our brain today. Uh, so this is really key to remember when dealing with a gr age group that is incredibly overwhelmed by its emotion all the time. Yeah, one of the, somebody said it to me like this, um, and it really resonated with me, that I, I have to switch my perspective from this is a behavior that's happening to me and switching it to this is a behavior that's happening in front of me. Because if I'm able to switch that perspective, this is a behavior in front of me that's communicating something as opposed to this is happening to me, I'm getting yelled at, I'm getting cussed at, I'm whatever, and it's gonna change my response. And if this is something that's happening in front of me, it, it allows me to have a little thicker skin and a softer heart, and I'm going to change that, that, that response and be, um, respond hopefully more effectively. Let's see here. So because of where the brain is, they're, mu they're much more impulsive. Adolescents are going through um, an impulsive phase where they are seeking sensation um, and, and lack of planning and perseverance. And, and that sensation seeking can go positively and it can go negatively um, where they're looking for that novel or thrilling stimulation from a roller coaster or um, bungee jumping or skydiving or um, pushing their parents to get them ear piercings or tattoos or those types of things. It's very natural in this stage to explore and experiment. We skipped over or we're skipping over a video that I think really emphasizes how, because of where the brain development is, because of the pruning, we're really facing a use it or lose it um, situation here, where in adolescence, if they're, if they're not using that part of the brain that's learning um, another language, it becomes much more difficult. And so in adolescence, it's really important that they're exploring and experimenting because we want them to use all these different parts of the brain so they don't lose it, right? We really need to feed into this and support this, help the child um, in this area explore and experiment um, because it, it, in, it increases their, um, their ability to be a whole person, and it's so crucial also when you're trying to overcome um, and be resilient after trauma. Um, so this is really important, but we also see how it can, it can go really south, how it can be negative, where the exploring and experimenting might lead to substance abuse or drug use or um, other risky behaviors. And... As we go through development, in early childhood, we understand the world through our relationships, through our connections with our caregivers. As we get into adolescence, we're starting to understand ourselves as an individual and how we fit into the, the bigger scheme of things, how we fit in with our peers. And so peer group pressure is more emphasized as well, that all of these things um, align just perfectly for a lot of peer group pressure to be really influential. And that, that they are willing to override risk for that reward. So this study was, I think it's really interesting, where they would put a teen, an adolescent, in a driving simulator, and they were told to get from point A to point B as quickly, as they, they, quickly and safely as they could. Um, so they had them do that, and then they were told, I don't even know that the, the peers were even in the next room, but they were told that their peers were watching them. Or was the friend sitting in there? There was a friend that was added. And We need your mic, Lisa. If any of you are interested in Say reading about time. him, looking at how peer pressure affects the functioning of the brain and then uh, the behaviors of kids. And so Lawrence these kids, Steinberg. 
Right, Lawrence Steinberg Lawrence. had earphones on where they heard what sounded like their friends egging them on. They were not physically there, they just heard it. They could hear their friends egging them on and they still had to get from point A to point B as quickly and safely as possible. And as you can imagine, they were running a lot more red lights, they were making a lot riskier choices. Um, thankfully, this was only a simulation. But it's indicative of what's going on here that um, if peer pressure is involved, they're much more likely to take on a risk in order to keep up with their friends. So the comment earlier that we try to separate them from the trigger or try to separate them from their peers is so important, is a really great strategy because of this um, reward over risk. Um, and then as we're responding to reactions, we know that you know how they understand time, how they um, are influenced by social groups or by peers, is, is really prominent, and so we need to cool things down by speaking slower, using a tone of voice and facial expressions that are calmer, um, taking a step back, engage the frontal lobe, uh, kind of related to the, the, the questions and the processing through information, through asking appropriate questions, is engaging that frontal lobe. Really engage that frontal lobe um, so that they can think more critically and think of long-term consequences. So let's talk a little bit about um, normative development. So we understand more how this phase is working. Let's, let's look at other things that are really prominent with adolescents that are also very normal. That their self-image overrides self-interest. There was a lot of, of information on this and uh, how social media is even driving this and fueling this, that we would rather look cool with our friends than um, consider what is in our best interest. And um, it's all about me. I think as they're getting to this development stage, like I said, that this is um, where they're understanding where they fit in the world, where the pruning is really focusing themselves. It's very centric on them. And so it's, and then our culture with social media as well, the adolescents are very me centered. Um, we know they try to connect with their peers, their risk over reward. And uh, what do you think? Um, do you think either of these are thinking about the consequences? Absolutely not. And what do you think the friends in the car are saying? Do it, do it, do it. Here, wait, wait, wait. Let me turn on the video camera, right? How many likes do you think I can get? So what can, oh, were you going to say something to that? I was just going to uh, say that when we talk about effective adults on CISM, I, I'm only coming up here because someone told me to. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Um, but we want you to look at these particular um, handouts here, which we've been alluding to in the slides. The first one is best practices. Okay. And on the back of that, we talk about behavior, language, and timing. Can you put your mic up to your mouth? We, we talk about behavior, language, and timing in that PowerPoint, in that uh, handout. And much of what we've just shown on these slides is encapsulated here. And we can send you the originals, and they're also on the app. And a lot of that also has to do with how you communicate effectively with youth, which should be the other handout in here. Um, that you might want to look at. Um, remarkably, it's named Communicating Effectively with Youth. And um, we're going to talk in a minute about how you can put these best practices and communicating effectively together in two stories. I'll leave it back to you. So we will talk a little bit about these best practices, and then I think she'll share a story that will help um, kind of guide through some of these best practices. Um, what we say is behavior, language, timing. One of the most effective things you can do when responding to teens, especially when they've got that is exaggerated uh, amygdala, is be aware of your response. Be aware of what your behavior, your language, and your timing is, is communicating to them. 
And um, first and foremost, that requires that you're working as the surrogate prefrontal cortex or the, the surrogate frontal lobe, that you've really got to engage that upstairs part of the brain. You've got to stay calm and rational so that you can help the youth get to that place as well. And so how can you do that? Um, your language can be very focused on what you want them to do. So um, instead of saying, stop yelling, say, I need your voice to match mine, or your, your volume to match my volume, um, or speak quietly, please. Focusing on what you want them to do instead of um, focusing on the not. Because when we focus on the not, that's all that a youth can really think of. And in, in that irrational moment, it's hard to get there to, to what you're actually asking them to do. And then listen. Listening is, is really an art form. Being a good listener is something that we really need to practice and um, apply, especially to adolescents who are trying to find themselves um, and often feel misunderstood. Really take some time to listen to them and avoid mirroring. Uh, I love this picture of the mice, that oftentimes when a youth comes in hot, well, not just youth, when someone comes in hot in a, a hot cognition and we come in hot, we just continue to escalate. Instead, we need to avoid that mirroring and reflect the behavior that we would want them to. So we have um, this wonderful uh, story from Omaha PD where a, a television station came in to observe the training at OPD. And um, we had kids engage in the skit at the end of the training, as we do at every training. And um, an officer was told to play the role of an officer who did not have his strategies for youth on. And he was egging the kid on and shouting at the kid. And then the kid was shouting over him. And then the officer was trying to shout over the kid. And this 16-year-old boy stopped the skit and said, you know, I'm mirroring you to the officer. And the officer who had just learned about this was, whoa, but you're hearing some young people starting to learn some of these language, uh, these terms, and the language about their own behavior and adults' behavior, and you want to lean into that and use that. And this 60-year-old said to the officer, if you want to deal with someone behaving like me, my recommendation is you should talk very quietly, not even respond to us sometimes. So. Just a, a little amusing Omaha story. And I remember that kid was not like paid to say that. He was not coached. I was there. I, I know that. Um, use distractions. Uh, there's a couple of great stories from OPD that I've heard on how they use distractions. One of my favorite ones was um, there was an incident where a kid had driven into um, like a gas pump, um, like the poles in front of the gas pump. I don't even know the details. Um, and so law enforcement was coming out to sort it all through. And the friend, not even the driver of it, the friend was really worked up. Like, you can't give my friend a ticket and this, my blah, 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 blah. And like really, really worked up about it. And the officer said, hold up. Have you ever considered being an attorney someday? And the, 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 the kid was like, what? What are you talking about? He's like, well, you're, you're presenting a really good case here. Um, and so I just think maybe you would have a future in law enforcement. And she was like, no, no one's ever said that to me before. And was able to calm down the situation. And why I love that example so much is that it's not just a distraction. It's like a believing up distraction, right? They'll talk about saying, one officer says that he always comments on somebody's shoes. Like, wow, are those Jordans? Or um, what size of shoe do you wear, by the way? Things like that to get them distracted. But I love the attorney example because it's not just distracting them and helping her to calm down, but it's believing up and, and giving her like the feeling that somebody else believes that she has a future and that she's capable of things. Allow for safe face saving. Give them the opportunity to self-correct. I love the example of getting them away from their peers because um, it allows them to, you know, allows them to save their face, and that's so important at this phase of development. Understand that they present like a shark, but underneath they're just cuddly goldfish. Um, I don't know. Can you speak to good intentions? Yeah. It's disproportionately humiliating during adolescence to be manifested as a child, right? To cry, 
to be weak. And so many of them are zipping around with this fin on their back, and um, they're 30 millimeters away from losing it and crying at times, especially in stressful situations. And so they're going to do things that, and we're going to hear a lot about this during trauma, that um, suggest to the outside world they have an illusion of control, which they don't, because that's part of being a man, or it's part of being a woman, or an adult, for sure. And so if you take that sometimes at face value and say, all right, you're a young man here, what can we do together to find a solution? I'm sure that works well, and I'm sure some of you use that already, because again, this is the believing up or expecting up that we recommend as a, a, a practice to get them to the behavior you wanna see them using in the first place, right? So if instead of using that, um, you'd say, oh, you think you're a man? You're nothing but a little pisher. You know, you have lost an opportunity to move them closer to the goal of adulthood and solidified the fact that you can't be trusted because you're gonna degrade them. And then instead of focusing on what to do, you've just flipped the whole script and all they can think of is what a jerk you are. So I'm guessing if you're here, you know this already, but maybe not all your colleagues do. This is really important to remember how much that safe, uh, that face saving and that sense of self as a competent adult is key to healthy and adolescent development. Um, the next slide about um, the good intentions gone awry. I am the queen of that. I, I can tell you about the time I sent my grandparents in, in Florida um, whitefish by mail. Um, at, but a lot of kids are trying to do the right thing. And it's difficult for them to figure out how. They are very constrained and they're not sure what the right thing or the right path is. So their, their goal may be right, but the way to get there isn't clear to them. And again, that's our role as adults. We're the surrogate frontal lobe. We're the adults supposed to be helping them navigate. And all of you are here because you're dealing with young people who don't have adults in their lives doing that or can't do it to the way the kid needs to move forward. So very important to see this. If you look at some historical examples produced by the MacArthur Foundation um, of scenarios where the kid was trying to do the right thing but chose a path that led to a violent uh, result, you can see that big time. Oh, you're good. Sorry. Yep. And, and put things into perspective. We all know the analogy um, about mountains and mole holes, and we get it, that, that we need to, to keep this in perspective, which, again, I go back to, is this a behavior that's happening in front of me or happening to me? And I feel like that helps us put it in perspective, so we're better able to put it in perspective for the youth. And in choosing which, which hills are we, or which battles are we willing to, to fight, she already pointed out these um, best practices. And so just to wrap this up, the brains are, of adolescents are going through massive changes. Please do not um, underemphasize or underestimate how massive and significant these changes are. And these changes influence the way that youth perceive, process, and respond. And it's going to be different than that of adults. And so, um, until, until their brains start um, maturing in the mid to late 20s, we need to um, handle them in a way that is um, sensitive to all of these changes. So pay attention to your behavior, your language, and your timing. Now I will send it over to Lisa, who will Would you join me in thanking Jessica, who pinched hit here? Yeah. Thank you.